In this video, we're going to look at setting up Zoom in your course, from enabling Zoom on your course menu, to creating a meeting, to exploring what different settings mean, and to see what it looks like from a student's perspective in your course. Once you enter your course, you can get started by enabling Zoom on your course menu. Go to Settings and click on Navigation. The Navigation tab controls what goes on your course menu and in what order. Everything at the top of the navigation list are items that are enabled in your course or available to students. Everything separated at the bottom of the navigation list is hidden from students, but the items are available for you to use in your course if needed. If you have not used Zoom in your course before, you will find Zoom in the disabled items list. To enable Zoom, you can click the three dots that create the vertical ellipses to expand your menu, which includes the option to move or enable an item. In this case, we want to enable Zoom. Once it's in the enabled items list, you can also click and drag to rearrange items as you see fit, as well as disable items that you do not plan on using in your course. When you have made changes to your course navigation, remember to scroll down and press Save. Now that Zoom is enabled on your course menu, you can start creating Zoom meetings for students in this particular course. Click on Zoom. If it is your first time accessing Zoom in My Classes, you may be prompted with an option to allow Zoom to talk to your My Classes Canvas account so that it can sync with your courses. Authorize Zoom, and you will be taken to your instance of Zoom in My Classes. From this space, you can view upcoming meetings. If you have not used Zoom before, you will not have any meetings listed here. Previous meetings, this is where all concluded meetings will appear. I have left an example for you here of what that looks like. You will have access to and find information about your personal meeting room. Your personal meeting room is a static URL that is consistently associated with your Zoom account. If you recorded any Zoom meetings and saved them in the cloud, your recordings will appear here. You may notice the Schedule a New Meeting button at the top of the Zoom window. Click this button and you will be prompted to set up your meeting details. By default, the name of the course will be your topic, but ID&D recommends editing your title to make it more specific. For example, you may decide to have a recurring course meeting every Tuesday and Thursday at 10 a.m. when a synchronous course session was scheduled in Gullnet. In this case, I might title my topic Weekly Class Session, and I can add more details in the description. Under the calendar area, I can identify the first date that the Zoom meeting will occur, so the very next Tuesday at 10 a.m. And if class was 75 minutes, I might make this duration an hour and 15 minutes. And I verify the time zone that I'm creating this meeting in so that if students access this course from an area in a different time zone, it will clarify that it's 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time that I intend to start the meeting. You could schedule this as a one-time meeting, but since it's for a recurring course meeting, I'm going to click the recurring meeting option. And this is going to occur weekly during the course. So from the drop-down menu, I'll select weekly, and I'll select that it will happen every Tuesday and Thursday. For reoccurrences, you can add a number of specific occurrences. In this case, I'll end the series of meetings on July 30th. And the information will update to reflect the choices you have made. If you selected the option to require registration, each student would have to register for these weekly sessions in order to attend them. For this example, I will leave this unchecked. You can also set default audio and video settings upon meeting entry. For example, if you as the instructor would like your camera to be enabled at the beginning of every session, you can keep your camera on. And maybe you want all of your participants to have their cameras on by default also. You can choose whether you want to enforce that upon entry or not. Please note that participants can always turn off their camera during the session if needed. Your audio options allow participants to join the session via telephone, computer audio, or both. In this example, I'm going to leave both selected. If I have a student who is having audio issues on their computer, I want them to have the option to dial in by telephone as backup instead of not having an alternate option. Now let's look at some of your meeting options. In order to reduce the opportunity for uninvited guests, you may choose to require a meeting password. If you enter a meeting password, the password details will be included in the invite to your students to join this session every week. You may choose to use a random combination of numbers and letters or a specific password. 
Another meeting option you can utilize to reduce uninvited guests from joining is to only allow authenticated users to join. Essentially, this means they need to sign into Zoom. You may also want to choose the option to enable waiting room. Enabling a waiting room allows you as the host to control what participants join the meeting and when. This is another layer that enables you to control who is joining your Zoom session. Alternatively, you can select the option to enable participants to join before the host, meaning that they can enter the meeting before you have. This is kind of like students getting into the classroom before you get there, except it reduces your ability to control who is entering and when. For this example, I'm going to click Enable Waiting Room. The thing to keep in mind with the waiting room is that participants can only enter when you admit them. So if you start a session and you're delivering class, a student may join a little late, which may happen if they were having internet issues or had to update their instance of Zoom, or perhaps they forgot the password and they needed to go find the password again. If students have entered a little bit late, you'll want to keep an eye on that waiting room space so that you're not inadvertently keeping students that you do want to participate from joining the session. You will have to manually moderate that waiting room space during your class session. Depending on the size of your class, you may decide to mute participants upon entry. This may also be useful if you're having a guest speaker join the session. Even if you mute participants upon entry, if enabled, they can unmute their microphone to participate in class. As a best practice, you may choose not to mute microphones upon entry, but then to mute all participants during the session if someone is presenting instead of the whole class discussion taking place. It is also recommended that you record the meeting. That way students who are not able to attend class can watch the meeting afterwards. If you check the box to record the meeting automatically, you will not have to remember to press record every time you start a session. We also recommend recording a session in the cloud, which provides online storage space for each session that can be easily shared with students in the course. If you have someone designated to teach your course in the event that you are sick, you may choose to add them as an alternative host for the semester. This may also be useful if you are co-teaching or team teaching a course. You would simply enter the SU email of any alternative hosts that have permission to start the meeting on your behalf. You may also have the option to use your personal meeting ID, which is your personal meeting room that is always associated with your Zoom account. Your personal meeting room may be ideal for office hours. But for class spaces, you may want to use a unique Zoom ID for that session so that students from other sections aren't trying to enter the same waiting room. When you've made your changes, press Save. Once you save your details, you'll see the automatic generated ID for the Zoom meeting, which is different from my personal meeting room, as well as a link to invite attendees or an invitation that you can copy and email or send to people as needed. When we look at our upcoming meetings, you'll see that it has created a unique session for each Tuesday and Thursday meeting space, even though the meeting ID is the same. The first meeting that's scheduled will have a start button next to it, and they are listed in descending order. When you create a Zoom meeting in your course or a series of reoccurring meetings, students will automatically receive a notification in their My Classes inbox, listing the meeting details, including all scheduled sessions for a reoccurring meeting. Depending on the notification settings the students have set up in My Classes, emails will also automatically be sent to their goals.salisbury.edu email address. So what does this look like from a student's perspective? A student in your course can click on Zoom and they will see the same list of upcoming meetings, as well as previous meetings, such as the one that I had in the example, and any cloud recordings that you have made available. If I go back to the instructor view, you'll notice that under cloud recordings as the instructor, I have three sessions recorded. I have decided not to publish one of the recordings, but to publish the other two. This is one of the benefits to recording your Zoom class meetings in the cloud. Once you are ready to launch your weekly session, press Start. And Zoom will open in a new window. Click to open Zoom. And you will be prompted to join with your computer audio. There is already a student waiting to join the session. You will receive a notification that someone is in the waiting room. And you can either see the waiting room or admit that person now. Before we look at admitting someone, I just want to point out that because we set this session to automatically record, you will notice that the session is already recording. You can pause 
or stop the recording as needed. On the bottom menu, you have the option to mute or unmute yourself at any time. I disabled the automatic launch option before starting this session, but if I had webcams automatically launch on entry, my webcam would have automatically started upon entry. In order for this video to be less distracting, I will click stop video to disable the camera. Zoom has a security section where you can lock the meeting, enable waiting room if it was not already set up, and determine what participants are allowed to do. For example, in this session, I am allowing participants to share their screen, participate in the chat, unmute themselves at any time, but I am not letting them rename themselves, such as putting a nickname in. I could decide that they cannot share their screen so that they can only share the screen when I have granted permission. If needed, you can also remove or report participants who have joined your meeting. If you click on participants, you can actually see the participant list. Because I had the waiting room on, I have one student waiting to be admitted into the session. Once I press admit, I can see that I have allowed the student version of me into the session, but you'll notice student me does not have a camera enabled or audio enabled. If I hover over a participant, I can click on the more options to see what options I have for that participant. Here I can put them back in a waiting room. I can rename them. If I have someone typing closed captions for accessibility, I can, I can designate a specific participant as the person who was typing the closed captions. I can decide whether or not I allow them to record. I can make them a host or make them a co-host. Note that the level of control is different between host and co-host. Co-host would be equal to you where they have the power to change settings and end the meeting for all. I can also start a chat with that individual participant. Any participant can access this participant area and say yes to a question, no to a question, request that you go slower, request that you go faster, give a thumbs down, a thumbs up, clap for the session, indicate that they need a break, or indicate that they have stepped away. Note that these options may not be available if you have not enabled them. We'll look at enabling or disabling more options shortly. If you did not mute all participants upon entry because you want people to be talking before class starts or until a lecture piece starts, you can choose to mute all when it's time for you to start lecturing. If you do decide to mute all participants, you can take away their option to unmute themselves, meaning that they cannot participate in conversation at any time. This is really only recommended if you have a guest speaker that you don't want to be interrupted, but generally we would leave this checked so that at any point in time, people can unmute themselves to ask questions or participate in conversation. From this participant area, I can also do the mute participants upon entry, allow them to rename themselves, allow them to unmute themselves. I have additional options such as playing an enter and exit chime when people enter or leave the session, which you may want to enable if you do not have a waiting room. If at any time you want to see more screen, you need more real estate, you can hit the drop down arrow and close extra windows such as the participant window or to move between windows. So I've closed out participants and now I may choose to enable the chat window. And in this chat area, you can type instructions or messages to everyone, or you may choose to send a private message to an individual participant. Note that if you send a private message, you will have to go back to message everyone in the meeting to address the whole class. And it may be useful to know that you can also save the chat. You may choose to save the chat as a way to take attendance, for example. You may decide to have interactive engagement, you know, use it for icebreakers. Um, what was a question that you had about this content? And then people can type their questions there. You, you may decide to do this instead of um, having them say it if you don't want everyone to unmute themselves. And if you want to download the chat and have a record of the questions later to address, you can also determine who your participants can chat with. So for example, if you do not want students to be chatting privately with one another, you can say that they can chat with only the host, you as the instructor, and not with everyone publicly and privately. Or you may say they can talk to the whole class, but you want them to only talk to the class publicly and not anyone privately. If you want to disable chat, you can select no one. This would really only allow you to use the space to provide resources to them, but then they can't communicate back with you. And again, if we no longer need this chat area, we can close it or we can pop it out if we want it floating where we can put it somewhere else. For example, if you have two screens, you may choose to, to drag this to your second screen. If you don't need it anymore, you can close it out. We can always return to the chat by enabling this window.
Now you'll notice that I have a pause and stop recording on the menu because it started recording by default. If I had not checked the option to record automatically, I can start recording here at any time. There would be a record button here instead of the pause or stop. This may be useful if you intend to not record classes, but you want to record presentations in classes. So if the first half of your class is a lecture and the second half is presentations, you may choose before presentations start to press record but not record the first half. Again, for online hybrid and, and remote learning, we do recommend recording those sessions so the students can go back and review the content of the lesson. If you have someone live closed captioning, or if you yourself are closed captioning while someone else is presenting, you can enable a closed captioning system. This may be utilized if you have someone in the class and they have an accommodation where someone has to come in and closed caption everything live. Another option you have to increase engagement is to go from whole class discussion to group discussion by creating breakout rooms. So if you click on the breakout room tab, you'll be given a prompt with how many participants you have, how many rooms you want to create. Now in this case, I only have one test participant, but if I had 15 students, I may choose to have three rooms with five students each where I can automatically randomly assign or I can manually assign which participant goes to which room. If I click create rooms, I will have the option to assign specific students to specific rooms or to move students between breakout rooms. If needed, you can always add a room or have the room close after a set amount of time. So if you want students to talk for 10 minutes and be automatically brought back into the whole class discussion, you can set a time limit that will count down. Even if you do not set this time limit, you as the host always have the option to close the rooms at any time. You can allow participants to return to the main session at any time. And when the session is going to end, whether it triggers based on an automatic time limit or whether you manually end the session, participants will receive a countdown timer of either 10, 15, 30, 60, or 120 seconds to give them time to finish up their conversations before returning to the main session for the whole class discussion. When you open the rooms, students will be invited to join the breakout room and you as the host can go between rooms in a fluid manner. When you are ready for it to end, you can close all rooms and that's when students will receive that countdown to return to the main room. You may also see a polls icon on this menu where you can create a poll that you can choose to be anonymous or not with a question prompt and optional answers and as many questions as you would like to add. When you are done, you can press save, which will allow you to present a poll to the class. This is another way to create engagement in your course. When you go to share your screen, you will have the option to select what you actually want to present. By default, you may choose to select your entire screen. This would be everything that's happening on your computer screen. If you have email open, you may choose to only show your PowerPoint. I could choose to show a web browser if I wanted to walk through the course and talk about modules or upcoming assignments. Uh, whatever I want to share, I can select that item and hit the share option. So now participants are seeing my web browser because that's what I have selected to share. However, if I've talked about the course and now I want to go to a presentation, I can hover over the menu items and go to new share and change what I display to students. So I may choose to share my PowerPoint now, and then I can go into presentation mode. When you are done sharing, you can stop your share, or you can pause your share, or you can annotate what you are sharing. If there's a specific screen you want to capture, or an annotation you want to capture, you can save that screen so that you can refer back to it after the session ends. But if you don't want to do this on a PowerPoint, one of the options that you have is to enable a whiteboard where people can annotate and draw in the class. And then again, you can clear viewers drawings, your drawings, or all drawings. When you're done sharing, you can stop share and you'll return to the class session. But note that you may decide that you want to click advanced sharing options and say that only you as the host can share your screen. So who can share is something that you can set as a default in your settings, only the host, so that you would have to grant permission for someone else to share or all participants. When your meeting has concluded, you can click end, which will give you the option to leave the meeting or end the meeting for all. 
And note that even though I launched the session for June 9th at 10 a.m. and I've stopped the recording, my cloud recording is not going to process until after the scheduled date and time concludes. So at 11.15 a.m. on June 9th, this session will move from upcoming meetings to previous meetings and the cloud recording will not show up as available until after that meeting has concluded and the video has finished processing. So this video was looking at Zoom from within my classes, setting up sessions for this course. But please note that only students in this course will have access to these Zoom recordings via this instance of Zoom. If you have another section of the class, they will only see their Zoom recordings. And if you have a third section, they will only see their Zoom recordings. So they do not integrate with each other. However, if you have a combined course section, you have to plan for the opposite, where you have three sections combined into one, so all students will have access to the Zoom sessions that are up here, which may confuse students if you have three reoccurring Zoom sessions, one for each course, because you have synchronous meetings, they might get confused about which one of these sessions they are meant to join. Furthermore, all students in the course will always be invited to all of the meetings. So creating a new meeting in my classes may not be ideal for a one-on-one -on -one meeting. An alternate way to do Zoom meetings is to go to salisbury.zoom.us and sign in using your SU login. Here under salisbury.zoom.us, you will see that everything that you create in your My Classes instances of Zoom will reflect in your broader salisbury.zoom.us profile but any sessions that you create here will not push back into your course. So for a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a student, I may decide to use my personal meeting room and provide this link as my office hours meeting room. But creating the meeting room here allows students for all classes to have one common space that they can come to, just like your office instead of a classroom. If you do decide to use your personal meeting room, we would definitely recommend enabling the waiting room so that if you are having a private conversation with one student, another student cannot drop in on the conversation by joining the meeting. To this degree, you would create the session the same way that you do when you are creating your session within Zoom in my classes. However, students will not automatically have access to this new meeting. You will need to copy the link to the session or copy the invitation and send it to specific individuals that you want to join. If you have three uncombined sections of a course, you may choose to add this to your syllabus or add this to a course information module in my classes, where they can always go and find the reoccurring open office hours meeting that you have scheduled for that semester. But I do want to point out that under salisbury.zoom.us, you can click on settings and you will have access to a list of additional default settings that you can set for your profile. For example, you can determine if you want to allow join before host, if you always want to require a password, if you want your sessions to default to hiding private chats, you can enable or disable sending files through the chat, you can decide to always have the option to allow a co-host. You can enable polling in your Zoom sessions. You can disable the annotations that we were looking at or the whiteboard that we were looking at or the nonverbal feedback. You can enable or disable the option to use virtual backgrounds. Enabling a virtual background allows for some privacy of the environment that is surrounding a student or a participant. So just recognize that there's a lot of options that you can turn on or turn off by default. You can look at basic settings, advanced settings, um, whatever you think you might want to enable. If you have additional questions about using Zoom, just know that if you come to the IT Help Desk Support site and click on Search the Knowledge Base, you can type in Zoom and you will receive a list of articles and guides with useful information about using Zoom. If you need further support with Zoom, you can click on Faculty and Staff, scroll down to Instructional Design and Delivery, and you will see a link to the ID&D Support Center where you can submit a help request for assistance. 